the world's largest and most powerful rocket. That's the title we all admit when talking about Starship, the rocket produced by SpaceX. With a height of 120 meters and a width of 9 meters, it is easy to understand why it is called the largest rocket in the world. But to be called the most powerful rocket, the Raptor engine is the factor that plays the most important role. As the aerospace industry develops, the appearance of new engines is a very normal thing but perhaps not many of them can develop for a long time and create impressions like the Raptor engine. Design, thrust, pressure, mass, and more. Everything is constantly improving and blowing the limits we can think of. So how did SpaceX's engine develop to become as powerful as it is today? Discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. In general, all of SpaceX's design processes and operations are based on the five golden steps set by Elon Musk with the goal of making everything faster, simpler, and more efficient. Raptor engine is no exception. We can easily recognize that when looking at how SpaceX developed their Raptor engine from the previous version, Raptor 1 to the current version, Raptor 2 and the future version, Raptor 3. The Raptor 1 is the first version of the switch to using Methalox fuel engines instead of liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene-like the Merlin engines used by the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. The advantage of methane is easier to produce, store, and burn more cleanly and efficiently than kerosene and is more suitable for missions like Mars. Compared to the Merlin engine, the Raptor engine used a full-flow staged combustion cycle improved from the open-cycle gas generator system to help increase performance and optimize fuel. The Raptor also used a large number of coaxial swirl injectors instead of pintel injectors applied dual redundant spark plug lit torch igniters, and engine materials and manufacturing technology were also improved. Thanks to that, the Raptor engine can increase thrust to 185 tons, twice the thrust of the Merlin engine, and the chamber pressure is also three times greater than the Merlin even though the two engines have similar sizes. In 2019, Elon Musk announced the test results of the Raptor engine with a chamber pressure of up to 268.9 bar, breaking the record held for decades by Russia's RD-180. The Raptor 1 version was produced and fully tested from February 2018 to July 2021. During that time, a new Raptor version was designed. By the end of 2021, this version began production and completely replaced Raptor 1. That is the Raptor 2 that SpaceX is using in the current Starship. Raptor 2 is a completely redesigned version compared to Raptor 1. When we put them next to each other, it is easy to see that Raptor 2 looks simpler, neater, and much lesser wiring system than its predecessor. This is because the turbo machinery, chamber, nozzle, sensors, and electronics were all redesigned or removed, and many flanges were converted to welds, while other parts like dual redundant spark plug lit torch igniters were simply replaced by a secret ignition. With structural simplification, Raptor 2 will reduce complex components and structures, making it lighter than the previous version, with a weight of 1.6 tons compared to 2 tons of Raptor 1. Thanks to that, Raptor 2 can be produced easier, faster, and cheaper than Raptor 1. Despite removing many components, with the new design, Raptor 2 is 25% more powerful than Raptor 1, achieving thrust of up to 230 tons with chamber pressure of up to 300 bar. With 33 engines and booster, Starship will achieve 7,590 tons or 16.8 million pounds of thrust. However, Raptor continues to have changes and upgrades especially in the past few months. That's because it still encountered some problems during its first orbital test flight. Specifically, when this flight liftoff, a few engines were not activated. During the flight, we saw some other engines that were also shut down. After the flight, SpaceX confirmed the failure came from the ignition, hydraulic power unit system, nozzle, and manifold system. After that, SpaceX made the necessary upgrades. They reinforced the nozzle and manifold system to help it withstand the extremely high temperature and pressure when the engine is activated, preventing fuel from leaking. The hydraulic power unit system was also replaced by the new electric TVC system, and the ignition was also upgraded to increase reliability for activating and maintaining the engine, avoiding failure of not activating or stopping working during flight. Perhaps it will have many other upgrades in the future, even after Starship is successfully launched. 
but compared to other engines, it can be said that Raptor 2 can still be considered one of the best engines today, a standard that other engines want to aim for. The title of the most powerful rocket for Starship is the most convincing evidence to prove Raptor 2's capabilities. But strides will not stop there. While companies are struggling to find ways to beat Raptor 2, SpaceX is creating a more formidable engine version Raptor 3. In May, SpaceX conducted a test with this new engine version and showed amazing data. The first stride is about thrust. The Raptor 3 engine generated up to 269 tons of thrust, 18% more powerful than the Raptor 2. It will also have a chamber pressure of 350 bar, a record that no other current engine can reach. In terms of mass, the engine is also lighter than previous versions at only about 1,4 tons. Currently, Super Heavy Booster uses 33 engines. If SpaceX transfers from Raptor 2 to Raptor 3, it will reach 8,877 tons or 19.5 million pounds of thrust. If successfully launched, it will certainly extinguish all hopes of competitors that have always had ambitions of defeating SpaceX's Raptor engines. While old engines with powerful thrusts like the RD-1880 gradually lose the playground, other competitors certainly cannot compare with the Raptor 3. There will be no engine more worthy than it to inherit the title of Emperor of the engine after the era of the legendary F-1 engine. Besides upgrades related to power, SpaceX also continuously accelerated their engine production pace throughout Raptor's development. In the first period, from February 2018 to 2021, about 36 months, SpaceX produced 100 Raptor 1 engines, meaning they would produce one engine every 11 days. However, when switching to the Raptor 2 version, that speed has been significantly increased. In 2021, Elon Musk revealed they can produce one engine every 48 hours. Perhaps that revelation is not an exaggeration. Raptor 2 started production at the end of 2021, and after only about 11 to 12 months last November, SpaceX posted a photo of the 200th Raptor engine they completed. Also by the end of last year, NASA confirmed that it only took SpaceX 24 hours to produce an engine. Since then, after a year, the number of their engines seems to have doubled. Specifically on October 31st, Deputy Administrator of NASA, Pamela Melroy posted a photo of her visit to SpaceX's Starbase. In the picture, she stands next to the Raptor engines. If we look closely at the far end of the picture, there is an engine with the number 398. That means SpaceX has produced close to 400 Raptor engines or more at the moment. But that certainly will not be the final goal of SpaceX. They will continue to accelerate even more strongly. You know, each Starship prototype will use 39 engines, with 33 engines in Super Heavy and 6 engines in Spacecraft. The future could be 42 if the spacecraft increases from 6 to 9 engines. 400 engines may sound like a lot, but it only takes about 10 prototypes to use them all. Meanwhile, Elon Musk's goal is to launch thousands of rockets every year in the future. Therefore, the number of engines needed will be many times more than the current number. That means the frequency of engine production will be greatly increased. It can be said that Raptor is like a miniature version of SpaceX. Simpler to be stronger sounds easy, but honestly, it's extremely difficult to do because that is the unique formula to create success for the world's largest aerospace company, SpaceX. Based on that formula, Raptor engines are reaching unbelievable limits in the aerospace industry. We have all witnessed how the Raptor operates in previous flights, but perhaps those performances are not enough to satisfy our expectations. Hopefully on the next flight, Starship as well as the Raptor engine will have a complete and successful performance to help us explode with emotions after many days of waiting. On September 20, 2023, SpaceX stirred up the atmosphere at the Founders Day Parade in McGregor, Texas, leaving onlookers in awe as they showcased a colossal Starship Raptor vacuum engine. The event marked SpaceX's first public appearance at the parade in the small town of McGregor, which has been home to the company's rocket testing facility since 2003. 
Simultaneously, this is also an opportunity for the company to showcase directly to the public one of the best inventions not only of them, but of the entire aerospace industry. Although less talked about than the sea level version, the Raptor vacuum engine is a key component in SpaceX's ambitious plan to return NASA astronauts to the moon and bring humans to Mars by Starship. It explains why this vacuum version of Raptor is engineered with unique and advanced technologies that promise to blow your mind. A vacuum engine or vacuum optimized rocket engine refers to a kind of engine dedicated to operation in space. It seems to be against the normal principle of Newton's third law. You know, rocket engines produce thrust by releasing mass rearward at a very high speed according to Newton's third law, not unlike how discharging a fire extinguisher pushes us backward. Flat earthers claim that rocket engines cannot possibly work in space because space is a vacuum and there is no air to push against. In reality, it is possible to produce thrust in a vacuum by releasing mass that we call propellants rearward rearward at a very high speed. So how can the vacuum operate efficiently in space without wasting propellants? At a glance, we can see clearly that the vacuum engines have a much larger nozzle than the sea level version as it needs to match the significantly lower air density in the upper atmosphere and the vacuum of space. The hot exhaust gases exiting a rocket's nozzle need to equal the external air pressure to maximize engine efficiency. At sea level, the air pressure is around 1,000 millibars. It quickly decreases with altitude to 100 millibars at 12 kilometers and only one millibar at 50 kilometers. This makes it impossible for one single nozzle design to maintain maximum efficiency throughout a launch vehicle's ascent. Fortunately, the principles of fluid dynamics dictate that the pressure of rocket exhaust gases decreases as the surface area of a nozzle increases without a loss in velocity. This means that the bigger or more expanded a rocket nozzle is, the lower the gas pressure. However, a too wide nozzle tends to lead to a phenomenon known as flow separation which happens when the flow of gas inside an engine separates from the nozzle wall. The RS-25 nozzle has an unusually large expansion ratio of about 77.5 per 1 for the chamber pressure. At sea level, a nozzle of this ratio would normally undergo flow separation of the jet from the nozzle, which would cause control difficulties and could even mechanically damage the vehicle. To aid the engine's operation, Rocketdyne engineers varied the angle of the nozzle walls from the theoretical optimum for thrust, reducing it near the exit. This raises the pressure just around the rim to an absolute pressure between 4.6 and 5.7 pounds per square inch and prevents flow separation. However, meet SpaceX vacuum. The team selected the nozzle size to be at the limit of what can be effectively tested in the atmosphere without encountering significant flow separation issues. It turns out that Raptor vacuum is optimized for development time because they only need to focus on certain design choices to speed up testing and iteration. A notable aspect is the use of copper sheets and Inconel in the manufacturing technique for Raptor nozzles. The process begins with a copper sheet from which channels are machined, creating the desired shape. This copper sheet is then sandwiched between two Inconel sheets, forming the channel walls. This manufacturing approach offers a departure from the laborious process of individually arranging and welding numerous pipes together, which was common for regeneratively cooled nozzles in older engine design. The use of copper and inconel provides a robust and efficient solution for the Raptor vacuum engine's nozzle construction. In addition to the nozzle size, the specific impulse on the Raptor is also worth noting. In September 2020, a successful full-duration test of the Raptor vacuum engine at SpaceX's development facility in McGregor, Texas, recorded the mark of approximately 380 seconds of specific impulse. This is even higher than the best Russian engine, the RD-180 with around 338 seconds, and Blue Origin's BE-4, which is expected to have a specific impulse of around 311 seconds. For Starship, which has three vacuum engines, the total of specific impulses will be 1,140 seconds, a significant number, right? Not only that, Raptor Vacuum also makes a strong impression with its enormous thrust. Its second version achieved 569,000 pounds of thrust and worked very well in Flight 2. This motivated SpaceX to go further with the third version. Although the detail around Raptor Vacuum 3 has not been revealed yet, we are sure that its thrust will be increased much to be able to shock everyone. It would be a game changer for Starship in its missions in the deep space. This is due to the efficiency of the full flow staged 
combustion cycle on which the Raptor operates and the methane propellant that it consumes. A full flow staged combustion cycle is difficult to develop, but it can produce energy extremely efficiently. Being a full flow means there's a fuel rich turbo pump and an oxygen rich turbo pump with the output from both turbo pumps combined in the chamber. Decryomethalox means a lower mass of fuel and oxygen produces more thrust as long as they operate at the same temperature and chamber pressure, but SpaceX is also increasing those parameters. When all of those things are combined into a real rocket, the only loss is we get a much larger rocket, because methane is much less dense than rapone, even under extremely cold temperatures. The empty rocket mass ends up higher to accommodate the larger tanks, but the lower methane mass much more than makes up for that in mass. Meanwhile, the ERD-180 used closed cycle staged combustion fueled by rich liquid oxygen and kerosene, BE-4 is an oxygen-rich liquefied methane-fueled staged combustion rocket engine. Unlike some normal rockets which just install one vacuum engine in the second stages, SpaceX still prioritizes using many engines, including three vacuum and three sea level at the present prototype. Although this boosts the spacecraft more power, it further heats the temperature in the engine area up easily causing catastrophic explosions. So, the company has applied a method, namely regenerative cooling to cool down Raptor. Elon also mentioned it in his tweet in June 2017, will be full regenerative cooled all the way out to the 3 meter 10 FD nozzle diameter. Heat flux is nuts and radiative view factor is low. Regenerative cooling, in the context of rocket engine design, is a configuration in which some or all of the propellant is passed through tubes, channels, or in a jacket around the combustion chamber or nozzle to cool the engine. This is effective because the propellants are often cryogenic. The heated propellant is then fed into a special gas generator or injected directly into the main combustion chamber. In the case of Raptor, this system is utilized to prevent heat transfer from the Raptor vacuum's nozzle to the surrounding skirt. In this system, methane, the propellant used by the engine, is pumped through the walls of the nozzle, effectively cooling it during firing. This approach is necessary because, unlike the Merlin vacuum engine, where the nozzle is exposed to space, the vacuum nozzle is situated within the skirt. Thus, it is essential to maintain a cool nozzle without vertently heating the surrounding structure. As a result, heat flux is nuts and the radiative view factor is low. Heat flux is the rate of heat transfer per unit area or delivered by the exhaust to the bell. In this context, the radiative view factor is how much empty cold space is visible to the bell with a single vacuum engine completely uncovered as is typical in a second stage, all parts of the bell are exposed to the cold vacuum of space. If the heat flux is low enough, you can simply choose materials for the bell that will survive temperatures that will radiate heat at the same rate as the exhaust's heat flux goes into the bell. Space is cold and nigh infinite, so no heat comes back and the bell will withstand a steady state condition. With the Raptor vacuum, they're surrounded by other Raptor vacuums, so any heat that gets radiated away is radiated back. Also, those on one side are next to a heat shield, which will heat up and radiate heat back to the engine bell. Thus, you can't use radiation cooling for the engine bell, and that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.